guest speaker for the session, Dr. Martin Toms, Professor Kluka, Dr. G. Kishore, uh, invited guests, and my dear friends. Indeed, it's a great honor for the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Kelo India, Thai LNCP, to have Dr. Martin Toms, a very distinguished speaker for the PE Physical Education and Community Coaching Program. The interaction goes like this. Dr. Martin is a senior lecturer, associate professor, School of Sport, Exercise and Rehabilitation Sciences, University of Birmingham, UK, adjunct professor, School of Kinesiology, Uni University of Regina, Canada, and uh, he had his PhD from Loughborough University, Department of Sports Science. He's also a member of the British Sociological Association that deals with youth study group, sport and leisure study group, England and Wales Cricket Board Coaches Association. He's also a member of the European Association of Sport and Society, a board member of Higher Education Academy, and uh, selected to membership in, uh, in 2007. International Sports Sociology Association. His current representation of working group includes English Federation of Disabilities Sport Working Group, uh, Herefordshire Sport, and international engagements. He's got a very significant contribution with Sports Authority of India. University of Birmingham and Sports Authority of India lead working with SAI in the development of their sports science and coaching curriculum and the development of sports scientists and coaches. This has included multiple visits to India, the hosting of multiple groups of sports scientists and athletes. In addition, advising Sports Authority of India on the development of the strategies around establishing a university sports science curriculum, integration of coaching and sports science facilities, location of a high performance center, and opportunities of community engagement as part of the contextual and culturally appropriate talent pathways. Hosting of multiple groups of SAI, India Institute funded by fellow Dr. Meenu Dingra, senior sports scientist, leading meetings in India, attended by key partners and prospective partners, JSW Sport, Reliance Sport, Government of Punjab, Odisha, Maharashtra. Lead for partnership development in India, including Sports Authority of India, Inspire Institute of Sports, NSU. India UK Consortium for Sports Development India. The lead chair of UK partnership, the aim of the consortium is to explore the capacity building of sport in academia in Indian universities using the development skills active sector skills council with FICI, Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. UK partners within this group, Bournemouth University, Chester University, Liverpool, John Moose University, University of South Wales, University of St. Mark and St. John, Skills Active, European Observatory and Sport Employment, press related global sports education. Indeed, it's a great honor because it's, it's due to the initiative taken by Dr. Martin that in India, we could upgrade ourselves in, in, in terms of setting up of sports sciences and having a collaboration. So once again, on behalf of each and everyone present here, a warm welcome to our most distinguished speaker, Professor Martin. So for your session, please. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Thank you very much for that um, um, welcome. And uh, I must uh, extend my thanks to all of my friends and colleagues at SAI who are here, uh, notably Dr. Pradeep Dutta, who uh, contacted me to um, get involved in this, um, which is fantastic. I also like to um, offer my thanks um, and congratulate the Honourable Minister for coming up with these, uh, these ideas and being very, very supportive uh, of all of this online webinar series. So I think it's a, a fantastic move and I'm very honoured to be a part of this. Um, one of the things I'd just like to, to start off with is just to try and put a little bit of this into context so those of you who I hope can um, can hear me well and do please 
um, let me know if, if you cannot. I want to put this talk in the context of the UK, and I think that's really, really important. Um, the, hold on one second, technical hitch. Uh, okay. As always with these things, there's always minor technical issues. Any problem, please? Uh, you can see the screen. There's a screen sharing on. Screen sharing is on, but the slide's not moving. So, oh, here we go. Okay, apologies for that. Okay, so the, the aims of the presentation really to try and explore the context of sports um, in the UK in particular. Um, because we have a particular way and approach of delivering sport at community, physical education and also elite level. Um, what I want to do is actually create a discussion and a bit of debate. Um, and I think that's really, really important. What we need to be able to do as coaches, academics, PE teachers is explore our context and then try and look at how we can have an impact at the grassroots level that will then have an impact on the elite level. So that's very, very important. Um, indeed, at the same time as that, we also need to be able to consider what needs to be done in India, what the particular needs are of particular geographical reg regions, states, cities, rural areas, to really try and look at this in context. Ultimately, what I want to do is to be able to help support and build the grassroots and therefore the elite capacity of sport in India. And hopefully this talk will go a little way about doing that and actually begin to challenge uh, and make individuals think a little bit more. Um, I have to say at the start, there is no easy answer when it comes to finding talent in youth sport. Uh, no matter what we think and what we try, actually being successful at doing that is very, very difficult. But actually the UK seems to have come up with a method that works for us. Um, and I'll explain that as we go. Um, as an academic, I will always say we need more research. Uh, there can never be enough research done on youth sports, on talent, um, in any context and particularly in an Indian context um, and I think that's a really important thing to consider that universities, academics have a very important role to play in this, uh, this whole process all the way from physical education teaching all the way to community sport all the way to elite sport. Um, just a little bit about the, the University of Birmingham. Um, we are one of the top 100 universities in the world according to the QS World Rankings. Um, we are known as an elite Russell Group University. Um, I am part of the group called the University of Birmingham India Institute, uh, which was launched officially, although we've been in existence for a number of years, um, in Delhi back in February this year. Um, so we had a number of ministers um, attend and take part as part of that launch. We also have a, an office uh, based um, in Delhi as well um, that has been in existence for about 15 or 20 years, but is now formalized. So a lot of the work the university does in India, and that includes work around medicine, um, technology, rural roads, railways, um, surgery, dentistry, all of those, um, research collaborations all take part through the uh, India Institute, as does the work we're doing in sport. Um, we are, as a university, well, we were the first university to offer a degree in sport 75 years ago. So we're, we're one of the first universities anywhere in the world to offer sport as a degree subject area. Um, and as a university, we have multiple Olympians, world champions, Commonwealth medalists. Um, and we have expertise in sports science um, across all areas of sports science, as you'll see. So we do have a very, very rich history, um, not only with working in India, but with the sports science at the same time. Most importantly and most excitingly, um, we are hosting on campus the Hockey and Squash 
for the Commonwealth Games 2022. So I very, very much hope that I will be able to welcome and see some of you as coaches in, in just two years time, which will be brilliant. Um, when it comes to sport and exercise, we are ranked number six in the world um, as a place to study sport and exercise. This is again, the QS World University ranking. So we are really at the top um, of our game when it comes to this. Um, I know there are a number of people listening uh, or watching um, who have been part of a number of groups who've come over um, with Sai. Um, so I look forward to potentially embarrassing some of you shortly. But as a school of sport and exercise science, we are heavily involved in working with lots of partners. Um, and our partnerships are crucial to our development as they are to anything else. Everything from Premier League football all the way through to healthcare um, and sport as well. Um, those of you who have visited our, our wonderful campus in Birmingham, uh, we will, on those pictures you can see at the bottom of the screen, in two years' time be hosting the Commonwealth Games hockey. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to welcoming the, uh, the hockey team as well as the squash um, over to Birmingham for that. Um, and a number of uh, players and coaches who I know personally, um, I will be looking forward to um, welcoming you over for that. Um, so we have great facilities. We, we, we're, we're a leading university when it comes to sport. Um, I think it's also a little bit important to say a little bit about me and my background to put this all into context. Um, I am a former professional cricket coach and PE teacher. So from, like many of you, I come from that sporting background and I've moved into academia. Um, I, as uh, Dr. Nair mentioned, I uh, have my PhD from Loughborough University. Um, I'm a social psychologist and I look at talent identification. Um, I've been lucky to work in sports science for over 25 years and lots of publications, funded research and collaboration with federations. Um, but actually, most importantly for me, is I've been really fortunate to work with both Vicky and Sai um, currently the Inspire Institute of Sport of Bangalore um, and also with the development of NSU and working with other private universities in India. Um, so I have a real close connotation but I'm also in the process of finalising my overseas citizenship um, having been um, or having been married to uh, a, a lady of Indian origin uh, for the last 23 years and a partner for 30 years so I have very very close affiliations with with India um, and it is my second home so I am delighted to be here. Okay um, those of you who have been over with Sai you may spot yourselves in some of these uh, pictures um, taken with the groups that we had um, in the centre you'll obviously note uh, the Honourable Minister um, who I had a meeting with uh, at his residence back in February with senior members of the university. So um, it is fantastic to be a part of this whole process. Um, again, lots of writing around India and work we've been doing, and I'm currently working with a number of other colleagues on a handbook of sports science in India as well, uh, with Indian academics um, putting in their um, engagement and thought around the development of sports science in the country as well. So I am heavily invested personally and professionally um, in helping India um, and learning from India what we can do. Okay, here we go. Ultimately, with anything we do and talk about with regards to sports, community sport and physical education, we need to make sure this is all put into context. What I'm going to talk about today is literally the context of sport in the UK and perhaps some of the tips and ideas and thoughts that, that India might want to consider or that we can look at and adapt and learn from as part of this process. Ultimately, what we're looking at is getting India to the top of the medals table. You will see the meteoric rise 
in just 20 years that Team GB had um, in the Olympic medals table, going from 15 medals and 36th to 67 medals and second in just the space of 20 years. Now, how on earth did we manage to do that? Um, there is an arms race in sport. There is technology, there is everything else. However, community sport in this process had a fundamental role to play in getting from that level at 36 all the way through to second. Part of that was around our Olympic funding. There is no doubt that the funding that has gone into our, um, our whole sports system and our Olympic system has had a significant contribution. Um, and a lot of that is directly linked to our, our national lottery that we have, where a good proportion of the money that goes into people buying tickets beyond prize money is actually then used for good causes, including sport. Um, so those of us based in the UK who bought a national lottery ticket um, are actually probably entitled to a very, very small amount of those medals ourselves because we have helped fund our elite sports people. It is not state funded. It is actually publicly funded through the lottery system, uh, which gives us a lot of strength, but also at the same time, a lot of weakness. OK, this is also a complex interplay of factors. The population size of the entire United Kingdom is the same size as the population of Gujarat. We are tiny as a nation. So population size, as a lot of the research will say, has a big influence on the type of opportunities you can have and where, what and where you can do. Secondly, the growth of sports science at universities. Um, this is something I'm very, very keen to promote and support and develop with universities in India in particular, but we have 75% of our universities in the UK all offer sports science degree courses. Um, so that is a significant impact um, on knowledge going through this whole process of sports science and the impact of sports science. That means that every year 2% of our entire graduate population graduate with knowledge of sports science. The majority of those go into working in sport, in physical education and in also in coaching. So underpinning that development of 20 years of elite performance, we have development of 20 years of graduates coming through supporting sport at every single level to help create those elite performers. So our sports science input starts at the very great grassroots basic level and goes all the way through our system. But that has taken 20 or 30 years to get there. It's not a quick fix. Um, we also have a school curriculum that is very focused on uh, physical education and our sporting season, if you like. Uh, the weather we have over here is very changeable. I am looking out of my window at home at the moment to see grey clouds and a little bit of rain. Uh, so we are fortunate that our sporting season, um, the fact that the weather is uh, fairly ambient most of the year allows us to play a lot of sport and activity uh, that helps us, again, create opportunities for young people and to play sport at community level. I've mentioned lottery uh, funding, so our, our lottery fund um, covers sport at almost every single level. Um, we've moved away from government funding directly to, uh, there is still some government funding in there, but most of our sport is funded, certainly at elite level, by, um, by our national lottery system. Uh, we do have, and this is where my, my work really fits in here, we do have a lot of community and school-based club sport. Uh, historically, we have always um, had club sport at the heart of what we do, um, and that has helped us build our whole system. 
Um, so I'll show you the performance pyramid that we often talk about later that will highlight that. We also, as you know, have a culture of sport in the UK. Nothing like the culture of cricket you have with the IPL, uh, the history of hockey that you have, but we have a culture of sport where everybody tries to engage. We have a culture where at a young age it is not unusual for children to go and play with the, in their local community club and the parents to be involved in coaching as volunteers and engaging uh, in that way as well. And we also have a research base and again I think this is really really important that we look at how we can explore and understand participation at a very young age all the way through so it can be supported um, at the top at the same time. And these are key things I think that the Indian government are well aware of with things like obviously Kalo India, Fit India and the TOPS programme as, as well. Okay, so how do we compare? We're tiny. As a nation, we have a population, as I've said, of 66.5 million for the whole of the GB. The population of England is only 56 million. And Yorkshire, a county you may well have heard, for, heard about when it comes to cricket, is our biggest population with 5.2 million. Uh, the smallest is the tiny county of Herefordshire, where I'm actually based, uh, where we have a population of 0 0.19 million. What we find from this and what we find from the level of inter internal county competition of community clubs is that the majority of our elite sports people actually come from Yorkshire. There have been times when our England cricket team um, have been made up of at least half Yorkshire players. And there's a specific reason for that, and that comes down to how each county runs its community sport system and the level of competition you need to do. So it is much harder to get into a county representative system in Yorkshire than it is in Herefordshire because the population is bigger and therefore competition is bigger. So it's an interesting perspective to think of about how we can apply that to just physical education and community sport. Okay, how does it work in the UK then? Um, and using our, the two, the Brownlee twins, Brownlee brothers, um, who are uh, our world triathlon champions and also from Yorkshire as well. How does it work? It's actually quite structured. We, we have a lot of school sport and mainly secondary school. So in the UK, away from COVID-19 lockdown, um, a lot of schools will play sport against each other mainly at secondary school level um, and they engage with and they compete uh, at in local competitions um, on a regular basis in either a league format or a friendly format or a tournament format uh, maybe that be within a particular small region or within a group of schools or however it might work what we're doing is we're offering children the opportunity to learn to compete if you like we also have our community club system. So um, if children are identified as being quite good within school, or if they have interest in playing sport, they can go to a, one of our local community clubs and play sport there uh, on a pay and play system, if you like. Um, so they can engage with coaching and receive coaching within those community clubs, uh, which is always very useful. Beyond that, if they become good enough, if they are talent identified, then they may go up to a county level and, and compete at county level. Um, and then those counties will compete against each other. They may go on to regional level, uh, where again, we're refining our talent pool, if you like. Um, and then they may go on to national or elite level. Now this works perfectly in the UK because of our size. We have 52 counties, it makes it a lot easier for us to do. Um, whether this is something that could be done within particular states or even within, I know with Kelo India it is done on this level, but even within particular um, 
areas within particular cities or districts or everything else. There are lots of ways that, that Kelo India can help support this um, and develop this as, as it is already. So it's, it's a really good way of, of, of working. Um, we are reliant on volunteers. So our community club system is entirely volunteer based. It is lottery funded to some extent. So um, money comes in from the lottery. Um, our community clubs can bid for pots of money to help build facilities, to maintain facilities. And it's also supported by people who pay and play, uh, pay a small amount of membership to join and give their time to actually help support and run this as part of our, our big society, if you like. Um, and this is because we, I guess, historically, this is the way it has always been in the UK. So our club history, um, I belong to a cricket club, a very small cricket club that only plays once a week in a local regional league. We can only get one team out, but the club has been going for 100 years. So we have a huge amount of history. That history is our strength, but at the same time in the 21st century, that history is now becoming our weakness. Uh, and I will explain a little bit more about that as we go through. So what we have is we have school sport that leads into community sport, that leads into representative sport, that leads into international sport. Um, and our athletes go up and down through that system. Uh, depending where they are and uh, what they are looking for. Ultimately, however, in the UK, our talent identification and detection system is actually based pretty much on luck. Uh, there is very little opportunity to test young people. That happens perhaps when they get to the regional representative level um, and certainly national level. So what we rely on is children playing a lot of sports to a young age and then by the age of maybe 16, 17, actually being identified as being talented. It's not a perfect system, but it's a system that is very cheap to run. Um, and it's a system that so far, based upon our medals table, is quite effective for us in this country. And there's a lot of debate about this, and I'm sure we can have a lot of debate about how it works. But talent detection and identification tends to be based upon how our um, club, community and school coaches perceive individuals, and then they push them through to representative level um, and give them the opportunity to engage that way. An example of some of our local clubs that we have here, uh, local to me, and what they may look like. So we have a lot of um, small individual sport clubs that may offer particular sports or particular opportunities within facilities they either have been gifted, uh, they own or they share with schools or other clubs or other government um, funded playing field um, systems. It is a very grassroots process and as I said it does have its weaknesses uh, because in the UK now as the cost of maintaining facilities is going up um, and there is a bigger dropout of young people playing sport, the number of clubs that exist is actually contracting. Uh, so we're now looking to Europe in particular to see how they manage their multi-sport clubs where you might have one facility but multiple sports playing in that one facility. I will use the example of NAS Patiala which I know very well and I see as, my very, as very much my second home as a fantastic example of a facility that has multiple sports and multiple places you can play. And I'm sure all of the SAI locations have that um, and is something that we need to look at as, as a means in the UK of consolidating all of our sports in one place. 
to continue with this theme, the the small um, market town where the, where I live um, at this moment in Herefordshire, a little town called Bromyard, um, has a population of approximately five thousand people. Um, it has one secondary school um, and one primary school. Um, and yet it has two football clubs, one cricket club and a rugby, archery and tennis club all based on one site in one area of the, uh, of the town. All of these are in different locations, they're marked where they, uh, they're highlighted and at the moment they are struggling financially to consolidate what they're doing and where they are. So at the moment we're having significant discussions about trying to put all sports in one place to make them more cost effective and give people more opportunity to engage. What the schools have within these organisations is they have very, very close links. Um, so the coaches, the volunteer coaches from these clubs will often go into the schools and do a coaching session, do some introduction sessions before those children come out and have their stronger experience of sport within those particular environments. So it works on a very, very local level in the UK. And once you scale up each of these thousands of little towns and villages um, that have this sort of system, you scale those up, then we have a lot of participation and a lot of engagement uh, in the UK, which help, helps feed our system. Um, which um, for us seems to work really well and efficiently in helping not just get people to play sport for a long period of time and to engage and support their community but also ultimately to the elite level because every single one of our Olympic gold medalists, our Commonwealth medalists, our world champions would have started in a system like this and gone through that process to make it to the top level. So our grassroots is really our strength. Yeah. So Martin, can I take a break with the question? Of course, Dr. Nair, certainly no problem That's one at all. question. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Sanjeev, please. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, one question is that, how can community sports helps in the development of youth sports in India? That is an exceptionally good question and it's, a, it's an exceptionally big challenge. Um, I think very much on a, um, on a local, on a regional level, what I would like to, to, to see, to hear about, and, and we've got a lot of coaches and, and physical education teachers and community coaches here is see the creation of very close links between schools within a particular area and community clubs um, such that the community club might become a hub for a number of schools to allow opportunity for people to for children of different ages to engage in coaching in playing and uh, and ultimately in involvement now that is a very very big challenge and it needs to be done very much with local knowledge at a local level but that i would say is one of the key things that, uh, that people can uh, can really that those of us listening in those of us involved in this can really do to make a difference at that level ultimately what we're trying to do here i guess is give young, young children the most opportunity to engage and play a sport and activity, such that talent will then develop. So the more we can do that, the better. At community level, I guess that will very much depend upon what facilities are available for those young people to play, whether a particular school has, a, has an area that could be um, used by the community to uh, to have coaching sessions to play sport 
whether there might be another area within the community that could do that, whether there is somebody who is philanthropic within that community who could gift an area of land that that could be done on, uh, will entirely be done at that local level. So there's no easy answer to this, but I think our role as community coaches, our role as PE teachers and academics is to look at that micro level and see what difference we can make with the, with the support of uh, the local governments, with the support of SAI and everybody else to actually try and grow that, that acorn into that oak tree at the end. Thank you. I hope that helps. Uh, now, uh, Martin, and then we have the questions to the end. So just a break. Okay. No problem, thank you. Okay, so this, this UK talent system, um, we do start very much with school sport. We do find, so to give my, myself as an example, and cricket, um, I played a lot of school cricket, I played a lot of community cricket, um, I was then selected into representative cricket, made it to a performance um, and academy level, unfortunately didn't make it to elite level, but I went through a process um, that was actually very supportive for me as an individual. Um, again, because we tend to do this within a county uh, level in the UK, which may mean within your states you may have to do it at district level. It's a way of beginning to bring the talent together uh, without forcing it too much. So, our selection and talent spotting system is very well organised, but still we cannot deny that it relies a little bit on luck. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that here. You have to be, you have to have a good game um, in the right place with the right people watching you in order for that to happen. Or you have to, most importantly, you have to be, have a good performance on a consistent level that you will become recognised locally. What would happen then is you would then be taken to the next stage and there will be more um, opportunity to play and compete um, at a higher level in order for you to, uh, to, to do that. It is worth pointing out that in the UK, our community clubs are mainly for adults. However, a number of them, or the majority of them, I hope, have um, junior sections, which means that if you're a very good junior, you can also then play in a local league or local competitions with adults. So I started my senior cricket at the age of 12, playing with adults. And that was at a local level, that was a very useful way of learning skills and gaining skills that way. Um, our athletes are not funded until they reach the age of 18. Um, and that only tends to happen at elite level. So I'm very aware of, of what's happening with, uh, with Kelo India and with the top system. And I think supporting athletes is a really, really good thing. Uh, absolutely. But in the UK, because of our system here, we tend not to support until people get to that performance academy or even elite level. It's just a choice that we've made. Um, we do have a late specialisation model in practice. Uh, so going back to that, that, that map I showed you of Bromyard, my hometown, there are a lot of young people who play rugby, football and cricket until around the age of 17 or 18. Um, and then they move on from there. And it is worth me saying, actually, and I forgot to say this, that we have produced elite performers uh, from our little town, including um, international... Um, uh, disabled archers as well. So it's not just about those who are able-bodied, but also the disabled. So the UK is very, very strong on our late specialisation model um, in practice, trying to give lots of children lots of opportunity to achieve. That again may be 
one of the reasons why we've achieved so many medals because we let people we've let a lot of our young people work out what is the best sport to achieve at a later age um, and so we are able to keep all options open for them we are planting an orchard of apples and allowing every single one of those apple trees to mature before we decide which is the best one um, to to pick from or which is the best one to then use and play sport with um, underpinning all of this and i cannot stress this enough for everybody here community clubs and coaches play the key role in this process our coaches are individuals who are working with the young age groups who are inspiring those young people at either physical education level or community club coaching level inspiring them to continue playing are actually in my view our gold medalists those are the people that are helping support sport from the bottom up um, and those are people who are often unrecognised um, in the global picture, but still play that vital role in going from school sport to community club all the way to elite level. Um, and if you talk to any elite sports person, they will often always talk about their first coach at grassroots level being the one who was most important to them and their development. So we cannot forget everybody in this room everybody listening to this has a significant role to play in this and has a an important recognition to be had of your role in developing elite sport even if you're not coaching them at elite level okay so within schools in the uk our primary school system we tend to have around about one hour of physical education per week between the ages of five and eleven so our state level primary school system where around about 90 percent of our young people go through um, the the other 10 percent go through the the fee paying private school sector and our primary school physical education is taught by non-physical education specialists and just is generic agility balance coordination skills a nice broad range of activities out of school children will be doing sport maybe with their friends or their family they may engage in community club sports but the main focus between 5 and 11 in the UK is on sampling lots of different activities and lots of play activities as a way of learning so our primary school system is very much based upon lots of opportunity lots of play and lots of generic skills rather than sport specific skills when our young people go to secondary school between the ages of 12 and 16 uh, that then changes to around about one to two hours of physical education per week um, that tends to be very mixed ability physical education um, which is a, a bit of a challenge for a lot of PE teachers um, and at this point you often have the inclusion of games within our curriculum our, our national curriculum for physical education will cover things like games um, in uh, invasion invasion sports like football and rugby and netball and basketball uh, there will be racket sports as well, so badminton, tennis. Um, we also have um, net games like um, netball, I've already mentioned, handball, all those sorts of things, volleyball, um, as well as athletics and dance within our curriculum as well. So all our young people get a taste within their physical education curriculum of maybe two to four hours of all of those activities throughout a year. We also at secondary school level have a lot of school teams and competitions. Uh, so every age group, almost every week, will be playing against another local team, um, a particular sport. Uh, so we will have uh, perhaps rugby being an example, 
um, a competition within our local region where schools will play a knockout against other schools. Um, and it's an opportunity for talent to develop and for talent identification by talent scouts to also occur. Out of school, there's a, again, uh, sport with friends and family, community clubs and representative sport. But most importantly, again, for those who are talented at a young age, the opportunity to play sport with people who are older. In certain sports like rugby, for example, and sometimes football, it is quite difficult to put young people in uh, with adults because of the, few, of the pure physical nature of the game. But it's something that we try and look at and try and play young people up, up an age group, if that's possible, if they show that talent. And again, um, and the research in the UK shows in particular um, that um, sampling and practice behaviour becomes important. So in order to increase our talent pool, what we do is we make sure that young people have as much opportunity to play as many sports as possible so they can be identified, work out what their best sport is, so that we can impact on this idea of about luck, which I'll talk about and I have talked about in other, uh, in other discussions. Um, our 17 and 18 year olds, what we see at 17 and 18 is a massive drop off in participation. Um, young people, there are other things to do. Uh, the ones who do stay in sport tend to be high level performers and often they will be involved in academy level sports. Um, out of sport, uh, out, sorry, out of school, the 17 or 18 year olds again may be doing community sport um, as adults. Uh, they may focus on just one or two sports. Um, and they may look at this idea about deliberate practice, far more sport specific practice and being more specialised at this age. Again, this is a system that seems to work well in the UK. Um, as young adults, um, as soon as people go to university or they find a job, then the participation rate in sport cuts around about by 95%. We have a huge drop in participation. There's limited time and engagement. Those who are good at sport may go to university, um, and I'm showing our, you know, some of our university scholars here, um, on scholarships. Uh, they may be engaging academic um, in academic study and are very often in sports science um, and they have dual careers in that way and they may go off and look for a career in sport or coaching or, or education. Out of university or out of work um, this just comes down to community level sport, people coming back to play sport. Um, there is a general trend in the 21st century for young people in the UK in particular to be leaving team sport behind and doing individual sports far more. So there is a rise of things like triathlon, cycling, um, running, a um, bit of tennis, sports that you don't need to do in an organised basis on an organised time. Um, and fitness is also coming in. So we're going through quite a change in the way that we understand um, sports participation with young people. I mentioned our performance pyramid. Um, whilst I theoretically I don't like the notion of a pyramid because it suggests that a lot of people drop out the side as you go through, it is quite a good way of conceptualising how we understand it. Our sports and physical education and our community based coaching is very much at that foundation and participation level. Uh, that is the role that we have. We have an important role in supporting those people who go on to elite level in the same way that primary school teachers have an important role in giving young people the skills to then go off and eventually study at university at doctoral level and become um, professors at university. 
both are equally as important. Um, and certainly our club network, our community sport network has a vital role in making sure that our top level sports is healthy. So the more that we can think about investing at that bottom level within community sports over time, the more we hope we will achieve at elite level. Uh, and that is something that our funding in the UK has proved to us that the more funding we put at grassroots level, the more likely we are to find people who achieve at elite level. Okay, so why are we so successful then? We facilitate a broad activity and broad opportunities for young people to engage in, not only with our PE curriculum, but also with our community sport curriculum as well. Uh, the activities that are done within the SAI centres, such as um, Pay and Play, are fantastic examples of where young people can come in and engage and play sport. Where that has, has been developed and adapted so that those young people can do a number of sports for a few weeks, and then move on to do a different sport. Um, certainly at a young age is fantastic, giving people the opportunity to learn what they're good at, to learn skills that you can change in between sports is also really useful. So think about ways we can do that within our physical education curriculum and also within community sports um, is also an important thing to do. Um, we have a lot of regular competition and leagues effectively from under nine upwards so a lot of community sport clubs that are large enough to do this will have one or two teams in for example in football um we'll have two, one or two teams that work um in, in, in possibly in either gender and both genders um, that have under 9, under 10, under 11, under 12, under 13, all the way up to under 16 and under 17 level that play regular competitions. Um, it's an effective and efficient way of doing it um, and it allows movement um, as well. So it is quite a good and strong and fundamental uh, system that again works for us here. Um, I would rec I would suggest that ev well, every single Premier English Premier League footballer um, will have gone through exactly this system to make it. One thing we don't do is we don't test our young athletes. Um, one of the things that the research uh, on our UK athletes has shown us is that actually. Uh, because the biological, psychological, social maturity of athletes does not happen until about the age of 18. Testing young athletes is useful, but actually we would rather invest that money in providing them opportunities to play. So whilst testing in academies and things does exist as a useful way of monitoring development, we don't actually use that as a way of testing beyond anything than representative or academy level. Uh, one reason is it's too expensive. Uh, so what we think about is we do our testing on our elite performers um, who are playing representative or above and are playing that for a long period of time. Uh, so we can make sure we have a solid, strong level of data that we have. Doesn't mean that testing is not important, but it needs to be done in an efficient way that is financially viable. Um, we have effectively, by accident, created a system uh, that works for our size and our context. Um, considering the size of our country compared to the likes of the other huge Olympic nations, the USA, China and Russia, we punch well above our weight. And we've done that 
through a series of careful thinking, structure, processes, history, and luck. It's taken us a lot of time to get there. And I think we are at the position where, because of our sports science input with our under to become PE teachers, coaches, community coaches, because of the knowledge of that, because of our, our, our size, our system within counties and regions, we've been able to develop a system that works. Now, a lot of the research that's been done on this, particularly in uh, North America, um, has highlighted that there is a particular size of a particular area that works most efficiently to develop talent in that respect. So it may be something that some research um, in, in India, contextual research will be useful in, in finding out a little bit more about. It is low cost, it is community, community focused, but our system is very, very reliant on volunteers and pay and play. It underpins everything we do. Um, and ultimately what we do as well is we promote this idea of diversification, playing lots of sports and lots of activities in order to find out what you're good at. Um, I often say, if you go to school, I'm sure your parents would not want you to just study one subject all the way through school. What you would want, they would want you to do is study lots of subjects in order to learn far more and actually work out what subject you were best at. For me, the same applies for sport. The more sport and activities you play, the more skills you can gain and the more chance you've got of moving between sports. So in the UK, talent transfer from one sport to another is exceptionally common. And a lot of our elite sports people, our gold medalists, started off at one sport, realised actually they may be better at something else that so they've grown and developed and moved across sports. Which is why we have so many medalists who are multi-sport champions. However, our system is not perfect. No system will ever be perfect. We are just working with the best that we've got. As I will always say, and I said at the start, context is key. So understanding your context is most important. Um, I've mentioned a little bit about volunteering and I know time is running out, but I'd like to just, just to highlight this in context a little bit. Our volunteer clubs are the community, they are the backbone of British sport, it is well known. We have community clubs that are run by 6.3 million volunteers, 10% of the adults in our community actually volunteer to help run uh, volunteer sports and academies. That's huge and that's why we're so reliant on, on our volunteer network. There are over 150,000 voluntary clubs in the UK. Uh, most of which are single sport focused, which, which is possibly one of our weaknesses. So we need to be aware of that. Our clubs have grown from our history of, of land, of population size, of growth of towns and cities and donation. Um, and as I said already, our clubs gain revenue from uh, lottery membership, um, from grants and from membership and match fees at the same time. Um, we have a coaching system, which I, I will go through very, very quickly, where we have our level one coaches that tends to be volunteers who work with beginners. Our level two tend to work with the community clubs. Our level three then may become paid and they may work with some professional clubs and counties and athletes. And our level four tend to be our elite coaches. So the majority, 99% of our coaches work within level one and level two. Um, so our, our coaches, and it's very, very different from the Indian system, tend to be volunteers and they work at grassroots um, with the local population to really help. Okay, so final slide. 
what recommendations can I have? What can I think about that um, physical education, schools, community clubs can engage with and maybe use to support what's happening in India to really make sure India is at the top of that medals table in a generation's time? The first thing I would say is think about this being both sport specific and also geographical. Um, I well know with the work of a lot of colleagues um, at SAI about kinetopometry, the importance of particular regions and states, the particular cultural nuance of where particular sports are played. For example, Adisa with the hockey is a great example. Um, and how important it is to work that way. It's important to put this into context. Uh, so think about what works best in your particular region or anything else. For example, there is no point in trying to develop skiing um, in Maharashtra when quite clearly the facilities and the geography does not work for that. So think about it in context. Think about what you can do as an individual, as a group of individuals at a local level. See what the government and federation are object, uh, objectives are for your sport at state level. How can you fit in? What opportunities are there to engage in that? What appropriate physical space is there near you as a coach that you can try and utilise to bring in more coaching opportunities? What processes are there to help you develop those opportunities? How can you link to schools or other clubs or other sports? Other organisations, for example, so we are very big in the UK about bringing in our, our scouts and uh, guides and brownies and cubs population of volunteer networks into sport. What other options are there there for you? Um, Promoting sport and diversification, I will always, always try and suggest this. See in what ways you can allow children to do a number of sports that may complement each other in such a way that they might become good at one. For example, handball and volleyball and basketball, there are a lot of interconnected skills there. So why not give children the opportunity to play all of those and work out what they're best at? Um, see if there is a way of ensuring sport for all, allowing children to play as much, engage and play as much sport as they possibly can at all times. Not always easy. Children and families have significant other responsibilities, particularly at the moment, than just sport. Um, I was very, very pleased to see that the Honourable Minister uh, for Sport mentioned a couple of days ago about the importance of physical education and a new physical education curriculum and I think that is a wonderful and fantastic move and building that in with community sport as well will be exceptionally good um, for the next generation of Olympians and not just those the next generation of people who enjoy playing sport who can give back to the next generation who may become Olympians and this notion of fit India because the more sport and activity we play the more and better we become um, regular competitions at a local level, uh, district, however, uh, at school level, however that might work. Um, school community partnerships, I think, are essential as well. However, again, I will go back to this idea that we as academics, uh, as professors, have an important role to play in researching all of this at the same time. We need to be working with physical education, with schools, with communities, uh, with federations in creating a roadmap for all sports in the future. Final slide. There are huge opportunities. Fit India, Kalu India, the TOPS programme, the initiatives that the Sports Authority uh, that SAI are doing, the initiatives that are done at state level, um, everything that's going on, have the athlete at the centre. What we then need to do is make sure we join up all the policy and strategy, all of club and community sport, all of physical education, all of coaching, 
to ensure that we can do the best job we can to create these athletes and ensure that they are our legacy. Our responsibility is not just watering that tree, but is planting that acorn to make sure that that tree grows in the best and healthiest way it possibly can. Thank you, Ved. Thank you. So thank you so much, Martin. It was wonderful. It was a real good session. So thank we can you. start with two questions. You want to have a, is it okay? Absolutely, of course, please so, do. So it was a marathon session where you were, uh, <laughs> there's a continuous talk. So Dr. Sanjeev Patel, please. Hey, mute. Uh, may I introduce Mr. Kavadar Kuspendra Gar? Yeah, yeah, please. I think uh, you know the speaker is not aware. You can just make a mention there. Thank you. Sorry, we have a distinguished guest with us. I'm an asset panelist. It's it's uh, uh, Kamada Kuspendra Gar. Who's the high performance director? Not in that. He is also the former world champion in Serie. So I think it's really an honor that we have among the panelists a, a world champion. So a <laughs> panelist has become very heavy and very important and dignified. So thank you so much for joining with us, sir, for this particular session. And uh, we could uh, we have Professor Martin for the information of sir, and you're already familiar with Kluka. And we have Beatrice uh, too. Uh, yeah, uh, Beatrice Ferreira, this is uh, Commander uh, Pushpendra Gurgsa, who is the former world sailing champion. So sir, we could come to you, but we'll, we'll have a session and then we'll come to you, sir. And most welcome to this particular session. We, we wish that you were with us throughout all the sessions too. Thank you, sir. And, um, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Patil, please. A question is from Balachandra. As mentioned, talent is by luck. How can we increase the chances of luck to favor us in identifying of talent in Indian context? What a wonderful question. I, I, I really wish I had the answer to that because I would sell it if I did. Um, I, I think for sure, the, I, and you, the, the word has been mentioned already, increasing chance will allow the opportunity for talent to emerge. So increasing chance by increasing opportunity is the key thing. Uh, and certainly the more opportunity young people have to play and engage, uh, be that at, at PE, at, at school, community, whatever level, the more opportunities they have, the more likely they are to be identified. So what we're trying to do is make sure that that orchard of apple trees can grow as tall as possible before we decide which one we want to select. So opportunity is key. Um, and that I think then comes down to making sure that our physical education teachers, our community coaches, everybody involved has a role to play in identifying potential. We can't really identify talent, we can identify potential that can then go forward to the next stage. So the ultimate thing I guess is give kids more opportunity, give them more chance and talent will emerge. One more question, sir. Question is from Sanjay Prajapati. How to develop community coaching in India so that rural areas also can be beneficial? Um, I, I'm a very big, I, I come from a very rural, considerably rural area for the UK. Um, so I think that's a really, really important and really good question. Um, it is one where partnership or collaboration becomes really important. 
collaboration and partnership with certainly with local schools um, certainly with local communities uh, becomes absolutely central um, whether that and whether there may be an advantage for people in rural communities because potentially there may be small areas of land that could be used for sport rather than agriculture I, it very much depends but certainly working with local schools local dignitaries um, and uh, local organizations i think is a key way forward developing sport and developing community sport is all about collaboration um, communication and partnership so whichever way that can be done um, whatever the context is i think that is the best way forward and with if possible the support of federations the support of um, the district and the state government and also SAI whether it be moral support or whatever then I think that's also really important one more question sir of course yeah um, uh, this question is from uh, Vinit Kumar uh, according to uh, you the selection of talent is based on luck uh, please elaborate as to what happens to the athletes who run out of luck but are talented uh, <laughs> do they pursue the sports future uh, any such examples uh, who are not lucky to be picked up but uh, still rose to international level and won medals uh, for united kingdom oh, what, what a fantastic challenging question i love that one um what happens is what we what we often do and this goes back to this idea about making sure our, our athletes are sampling they sample lots of activity so we will often find that people who are not successful in one sport uh, they may not be selected they may get injured for a particular reason actually have a fallback position and can become elite in another sport uh, so that is something that i think and Darlene, maybe to chip in on this one, happens an awful lot in the draft system in um, uh, American football and, and other sports where because a lot, of, a lot of athletes have a lot of talent, then that can be transferred between. So we have plenty of cases in the UK where people have dropped out of being elite sports people, elite footballers, for example, and actually used the skills they gain to go off and play other sports. Um, there are some very good examples of, um, let me think, uh, Olympic medalists who've gone in the, from the UK, who've gone from rowing to cycling and won gold medals. The skills are fairly similar, from rugby to soccer, uh, from handball to basketball, from rollerblading across to ice skating and ice hockey. So the skills become important. And the way that we manage those skills also unfortunately there will always be an element of bad luck um, in the uk in our in our football system and to use football as another example in our soccer uh, system um, we have a 99.9 percent .9 dropout rate from those in the academy to those who make it to professional level that is a problem that is a significant waste of sporting talent so what we are currently trying to do is work out ways of how can we re-engage those very talented young footballers and find out ways that they could involve themselves in other sports and other activities who could then go off and become olympic champions because those academies have spent a huge amount of time those young people and their families have invested a huge amount of time in sports and just because they happen to be unlucky uh, shouldn't then detract from them from becoming elite sports people in other sports or other activities so it's about managing this luck we can't we can't easily change it you can change where you live you can change your coach you can't easily change your dna and you can't change your parents so we have to work out how we can best manage what we call soft luck, which we can change, 
and hard luck that we can't. Yeah. So a very long answer to a very difficult question, uh, but we just have to work out how we can increase every young person's luck in some way. So thank you, Martin. Now, may I request uh, if it's uh, a Komoda Pushpendagal, sir? So, sir, for your remarks, please, sir. Uh, how could I have missed uh, Dr. Martin's lecture? I was really looking forward to this, to see him person to person, as I have been engaging with him in the last uh, few weeks uh, okay. regarding, you know, designing of some syllabus changes which we are going to effect in our NIS diploma. Oh. Dr. Martin, I have a question for you. Uh, what would your advice be to our PE teachers on designing their uh, daily, you know, daily lessons? Is there any, uh, do they need to, to program the lesson or do they need to design the lesson or they just go to the class and start off? Uh, should they be spending a lot of time in designing each of the uh, lesson for every class so that it really gives them, uh, you know, effective outputs out of that? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that's a really, really important question. Um, ultimately, within, within the UK, we have a national curriculum that every PE teacher has to follow. So it's very systematic, it's very well organised, and everybody knows what needs to be involved in that. Certainly, I think at the very least, uh, the physical education teachers, both at primary school and at secondary school level, need to engage with, um, I would suggest maybe not creating um, sport as such, but creating um, a curriculum that involves particular skills and skill sets. For example, I know in the UK, and probably a lot of the other parts of the world, and certainly India in particular, young children at the year coming into from primary to secondary school are struggling to throw and catch a ball because they're too used to playing on their mobile phone um, and those skills. So we need to be able to think of ways of um, working out what the key skills we want to develop are and embedding them within the curriculum so they can learn them. Um, certainly things like gymnastics, I think should be central to any curriculum. Uh, the basics of understanding body movement, of everything else, of, of doing things that will prevent uh, repetitive strain injury or, or injury that way should be important. So a, a broad range of those. But I would also, as a cricketer, I would say this, I would also recommend things like hand-eye coordination skills and learning to juggle. Yeah. What a skill that is. Um, it, it can create so much more. So I think those sorts of things, uh, other sports specific things can be built into the secondary, uh, secondary curriculum uh, that may be more sports specific. Um, kicking footballs, uh, throwing balls, racket sports, all of these things can be built in in such a way that when a child goes through their entire school curriculum, they've gone from learning the basics learning the ABCs at primary level to gaining skills as they go through. Um, I guess ultimately what we want to make all of our young people physically literate. Oh yes, that's a fantastic uh, answer. And that is the whole aim of uh, starting the physical education curriculum so early at school level. Also, uh, I think in India, uh, we do have a problem of, uh, you know, starting sports specialization at a very early stage. And uh, that is, uh, that is now changed, that is worldwide in developing countries, developed countries. You are always telling that multiple sports should be played. I think that message has to go down properly to our sporting fraternity as well. That if uh, we have academies starting from the age of eight and nine in uh, wrestling, in kabaddi, in shooting, uh, you know, where only one sport is given a lot of credence. So that has also got to change, I think. Yeah, thank you. No, no I agree. It, it's something I'm very, very passionate about. And 
those were those of you who were at SciCon back in 2017 uh, is something I spoke about at length um, and is an area that I've done a lot of research and a lot of um, publication work in. Um, I, I think one of the key things may be possibly grouping sports together rather than one specific sport so the skills can go together. Uh, so um, I've, I've had various conversations uh, and certainly with, with uh, previous DGs um, at SAI about uh, when we when we were welcomed uh, groups of uh, coaches and sports scientists to Birmingham for our, uh, our courses we were looking to put them into particular groups to explore that in a bit more detail so certainly there will be skill sets within sports that could be grouped so for example the play and the pay and play examples could have um, people doing racket sports or people doing invasion sport games or um, stick and ball sports in such a way that they are spreading themselves around a little bit at the same time i would love to do or I'd i would love for community clubs to be created in india that cover every single sport so a child can turn up on a monday and play cricket on a Tuesday do volleyball, on a Wednesday do hockey, on a Thursday do handball, on a Friday do wrestling, and be able to do that for as long as they wish until they can work out what the best, their favorite and the one they have most ability and aptitude in actually turns out to be. Thank you very much. Uh, I will leave you to other panels. Pleasure, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Commodore Pushpendra Gurk, sir. Uh, may I now request uh, Beatrix, who's from Brazil? Ma'am, for your remarks, please. Hello. Yeah. Congratulations, Martin. I enjoyed very much your presentation and uh, from Brazil to see the organization in the United Kingdom. Congratulations. And uh, well, I have a question. Um, I would like to know more about if you have some programs for immigrants and uh, more specifically for Muslim women. We know that uh, the, we talk about the diversity, but uh, not cultural diversity. How can you work with uh, this cultural in, in, the diversity in UK? I, we know that you have so many different cultures, religions, and uh, how do we work in sports? That, that is a very topical and very good question at the moment in particular. I, I think with everything else that's going on in the world, um, for sure. Um, it, it's a big challenge. It is a big challenge culturally in the UK to, to try and integrate more. It is interesting that this, is, this seems to be happening an awful lot more um, in some uh, European countries than maybe it does, um, does in the UK but within our curriculum within schools we're trying to integrate um everybody from particular different religions whether they be muslim whether uh, they be from uh, uh black or other minority ethnic groups into sport and also through sport uh, so in cricket we have a particular issue in the uk of um, having fewer um, Indian or Indian origin young players coming through and playing for our national team because culturally and I know this from my parents-in-law uh, culturally there is an awful focus awful more of a focus on education and studies than there is on playing sports um, so there is a lot more understanding that we need to have on this certainly there are groups um, um, and Darlene's group in particular, uh, uh, women and girls in sport, are trying to engage and do this. But it is, I think it is an ongoing issue that we need to, to globally, that we need to look at and find out ways of integrating. Um, I suppose, unfortunately, the colonialised nature of sport as it's developed has been something that theoretically has had an impact on 
people's involvement and we need to decolonialize not just the world but also our sport at the same time okay thank you thank you Beatrix. Professor Kluka, Dali Kluka please well uh uh, Dr. Toms, it's a pleasure to have listened to you and, and seen you. I, uh, I get, I'm getting so much out of this whole experience, more than you all will ever probably realize. This is fantastic. Uh, at any rate, let me, let me uh, present a little piece on to Martin's um, statements about opportunity. Um, it's also, I think, important to keep the two words, access and opportunity, together. Um, and the reason for that is really quite simple. Um, if, if, if we start a program and we give all sorts of children lots of opportunities, but they cannot get to the area, or they cannot um, feel welcome uh, into the situation, then it doesn't matter who's coaching or who's playing or how many great things we have going. So uh, as we think about things going forward, maybe we need to really say that we should keep those two words together whenever we speak. I don't know, Martin, how do you feel about that? I, I could not agree more on that, Darlene, at all. Absolutely. Ac access is something, when we talk about opportunity, we often forget about the practicalities, the realities of access be that geographical be that personal or actually be that family related can these kids get there Ju just to, to, to put a, a brief perspective on that as well um, we know in the UK that around about 33 percent of our young people come from a a single parent household mm -hmm. yeah which means that they have even less opportunity to access because they've got far more responsibilities at home, perhaps, or their parents just don't, or their parent just doesn't have time. So we really need to think, and as a sociologist, social psychologist, getting that at the at the bottom level becomes really important. We need to know about the whys for those young people, as well as the who's. So, Darlene, that is a fantastic point. Thank you for raising that. That's great. No worries. Uh, may I ask one other, um, it's, it's more of a what if kind of thing. Um, Martin also mentioned about um, those who perhaps are not lucky enough to get selected to move forward. And uh, his suggestion, I think, about trying to get them uh, into other activities uh, is fantastic. Maybe one of the things we also need to think about is how do we create in any part of the world an infrastructure that also supports sport participation? And part of that might have to do with, well, when we have things, we need coaches, we need officials, we need sport managers, we need people to give first aid uh, if they're injured and so on and so forth. So perhaps some of those folks who are not able to make the elite level, but still really want to be involved in sport, can select some of those other things. Now, I think what that requires is universities now have to start thinking, how can we offer coursework in order and degrees in order to support what they need? Uh, another example would be a sport journalist. Oh, some of those people who just can't quite make it. They make wonderful journalists for papers, for media, for whatever else is going on, um, even for blogs, uh, that's possible. So um, I don't know, again, Martin, what you think about that, but if you could uh, give us your, your viewpoint to that. Absolutely. I, I think you're, you're spot on with the the role of universities doing this and hopefully going back to the UK example the development of sport the exponential development of sports science within yeah. our university system has no doubt had an impact on our elite level sport uh, it has taken 
probably a generation or two for people to realise that studying sport at university is actually possible. It, it is valid. It's hard. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, having been having been of a generation where when I said that I wanted to go and study sport at university, my careers advisor and my head teacher laughed at me because they said, <laughs> where is, what future is there in sport? And knowing very well um, how the, 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 the culture and system is in India about, um, is, there, is there a career in sport? No, there isn't, so why would you study it? We then have to create, as you say, Darlene, we have to create those careers by having sports science programs that will then create more coaches, more support networks, more clubs and systems, and that will grow. Um, so certainly, yeah, absolutely, universities have a fundamental role to play in this, um, to lead it as well. Um, now, I sort of mentioned already that we, the University of Birmingham has been involved in the NSU uh, bid and development, and we're working as a university with a number of other private universities and some other organisations to help begin to build this potential. We need to get that ball rolling. We need to, um, as, uh, as, as experts from around the world, we need to water that acorn to create that sapling, to create that tree. Um, and then once that tree is flourishing, you, the, there will be enough faculty, there'll be enough staff, there'll be enough expertise that this will just develop and grow without any problem or any need. It is making sure we're doing that watering that I think is the key thing. Thank you. Great time to be alive, huh? It's fantastic. It's a wonderful time to be alive. And also to say it's wonderful to have the Commonwealth Games mm -hmm. 20 yards away from my office on Ooh. Birmingham campus in 2022. So please do come everybody. You'll be most welcome. <laughs> Thank you, that's nice. Um, thank you, Professor Kluka. Uh, Dr. Kishore, sir, please, for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, Tom's, you have been very, you know, you have put forth all the facts very uh, frankly and rather bluntly. You, are, you have even exposed the flaws and the setbacks too. No, but the world, uh, we look, UK with envy and a lot of... Uh, you know, the way in which you have London Olympics 2012 done, uh, which was a big success and uh, also economically it is said that it has brought over 14.8 billion uh, net profit uh, in the, and that is one of the most successful Olympic Games ever held. And success, secondly, is the leap made by UK in the medal tally. And uh, we are still left to find out what was the secrets of course, Maybe you can also tell us some of the secrets behind the success, both economic and also uh, in performance level in 2000. That is one. Secondly, is about the ladder which you have shown that school, sports, community club, representative performance academy to elite. That is the system followed. And we understand that in UK, you have two, two bodies dealing with the sports. One is the UK sports and sports England. Sports England by Nick and Nigel with UK Sports, if I understand it is correct. And uh, uh, how is this, you know, because UK talent system and school sports will be done by, I think, should be Sports England and UK, it will get transferred to the elite level. Um, when it comes to uh, the performance academy, it would be with, uh, should be with uh, uh, UK Sports. So how, how is this differentiating and where is the borderline? between Sports England and UK Sports. You have also in your concluding remarks mentioned about that universities has a fundamental role to play and example of Birmingham University. I also think that Loughborough University also plays a key role there. And they, in fact, the Indian, the entire, uh, the national teams of uh, England are trained at Loughborough University campus. And the UK Sports and uh, Sports England both have their headquarters also in Loughborough Sports. Laudro University campus. So, uh, would you like to throw some lights about these three areas which I have uh, touched upon? Yeah, certainly. Okay, so to start with, with the 2012 um, Olympics, yeah, absolutely, it was a huge success uh, for us as a medals table, but it cost a lot of money. 
um, as all Olympic Games do. Um, so the facilities are some most of the facilities and they were being built to be used again are, are still in use um which it, which is a positive thing um unfortunately the main legacy that we aimed for to get more people involved in sports in the uk did not work there is no evidence at all that post 2012 more people were involved in sport in the uk um, and that is probably a problem for a lot of activities and is no different really to the fact that every time Wimbledon is on uh, for tennis in the UK, the tennis courts are full. Two weeks after Wimbledon, they're empty. Um, so we, we have that. We, we are still debating the success of London 2012 in terms of, of cost, in terms of facilities. One thing it has done uh, for us is, is raised our profile around the world and there is no doubt it was a good thing and we did very well. Uh, however, if you want to measure our long-term success by how it's helped our nation become fitter or better, then we have to be critical of it and say, actually, there's not a huge amount of evidence that that actually happened. So long-term is, is, is a separate thing. Um, the, the second issue around about the... the the process uh, uh, and how it works and, and how it works with our, our sports is it tends to be politically very federation based here within counties and everything else. So UK sport and Sport England only really get involved at the top level. Certainly UK sport does at the top level for um, funding our elite performers. Everything beyond below that tends to be done by uh, grassroots and federations um, in that same respect. So it is not a clear picture. We have many, many governing bodies involved in many sports um, and is not straightforward. And that is one of our Achilles heels of the history of our development of sport in this country. So for example, one sport I know quite well, golf, in this country has 34 different bodies all vying for power. Um, so it is a complex situation. Uh, so it, it's not entirely clear. Certainly elite level is fairly straightforward because our Team GB is mainly UK sport based and Sport England are the ones who we tend to bid for for funding at the grassroots because they hold a pot of money that has come from our national lottery. So again, it's not a clear picture. In terms of, of, of your final point, uh, my alma mater, Loughborough University, where I did my PhD. Um, yeah, absolutely, Loughborough and, and Birmingham. Uh, we are well known for our, um, our rivalry, academically and in sports. Um, and the facilities they have at Loughborough, because of the, the geography of where it is, mean they are able to to have uh, facilities because Birmingham is based in the city of Birmingham. Um, we, we, we can't expand as much as they've been able to. So whilst we have really close links uh, with our colleagues at Loughborough, we have a lot of links that way. Um, they tend to have the facilities uh, around them that they use and a lot of uh, federations, governing bodies um, are, are historically based there as well but um yes we're very good friends and we're also very good rivals um and i have a foot in both camps uh being a graduate of there uh, but also a, a a member of staff at birmingham for the last 20 years i hope that's answered those questions thank you thank you so much uh, and it was very informative thank, thank you for all answering the questions thank you so I'd like to, Martin, it was a wonderful session. Thank you so much. I'm sure you sowed the seed for the community coaching and with all the experts over here, the, the things have come in well. So I think in very, very soon it will start coming up. So you can see the full tree maybe in another a year's time. So wonderful. thank you so much for sowing the seed. <laughs> That's an absolute pleasure.
and uh, secondly you know, you're welcomed us for the common but i think you're so uh, we are honored because a university have conducting i mean organizing or being a venue for the commonwealth is something a, ma a matter of honor so indeed it's, it's a time. proud moment for us too where yeah, we have a, so please please do come and visit you're more than welcome so all the participants are there i'm sure the all the participants are quite keen so they look forward to visiting you for the for the commonwealth so on behalf of the ministry of youth affairs and sports kelo india and from the um, on behalf of all the participants here i need to thank uh, professor martin it was an excellent session we didn't want to stop it but we had time constraint so thank you so much i salute you and it was a wonderful session a memorable it was like a movie we were watching you took us through the journey across <laughs> and i'm sure that will always be with us so thank you so much uh, thank professor you. martin and, and please, one, one very quick last word for me. If anybody does want to get in touch with me, please do pass on my my details and contact details. There's no problem at all. We definitely put your email address, email onto it, and all the participants, so that any queries anybody has got, they'll get 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 to you. Wonderful. Thank you. So <clears throat> thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Uh, Commodore uh, Pushmeda Dal sir. We have a uh, the uh, the world champion with us. So thank you so much for being a part of this session. And I'm sure we're looking at you. We should be having many more champions coming up because you are the one who's a role model, could inspire many more. So our PE teachers would definitely come out with, produce more Olympians. So it's PE to the Olympic podium. So that's the first stepping stone. Thank you so much, sir, for your for your gracious presence. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kluka. It's been it's been um, a matter where we feel that you are a part of us. So I don't find that you are someone else. And for, for the information, uh, Ma'am Kluka is in the Hall of Fame for volleyball, for the US volleyball, a very, again, international figure, which many do not know. So we have got a very renowned person. So thank you so much for being part of us. So I find this, uh, the day we don't see you, we find the light is not, it's dar dark. <laughs> it's light now. Thank you so much for your gracious presence. Beatrix, I find you coming in. You come all the way from Brazil, and I'm sure your presence again has helped us a lot. We all look forward to your session in the future. Thank you so much, Beatrix. I'd like to thank Kishore sir, who's a pillar, who's a strength, and uh, who has made this again, this event possible. So thank you so much, Kishore sir, where he makes it a point of uh, attending all the sessions to see that none of the sessions are missed. So thank you so much, Kishore sir. I'd like to thank all invited guests because among our panelists, I think there are a lot of guests and participants. Also, we may have international delegates who are attending this. So I'd like to thank each participant. I'd like to thank my co-host, Dr. Sanjeev Patel. You've done a wonderful job. It was so nice having you with us. So once again, to each and everyone, a real thank you. And before we end up, tomorrow there's a session at 12.30 uh, 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 in the afternoon. We have uh, the uh, five basketball sisters will be coming in for a session. All the four sisters are international basketballers. Together, the entire group would come in and then they would have an interaction with our uh, P community. So I uh, welcome each one of you so that please to join us where we have the, a family of international of basketball coming in where they're going to have an interaction. So once again, to each and every one, thank you and namaste. See Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.